the you know the offense really started well ever since i got on youtube <laughs> but uh you know right away and uh but there were some things i taught that didn't just offend the lord shippers they offended the people that everybody thought were grace and the reason for that was because there were people who had self-righteous a legalistic works sense of righteousness but were justified by faith uh so you can be justified by faith but not know how to stand in it and still be building up your own righteousness and if that's the case you will be offended if a teaching uh that addresses whatever you're clinging on to um comes too close to home and that's what happens you know the first one i did that really started to offend people in the grace community so called was uh teaching on the cross for sanctification which led to teaching on the cross about love and that's the one that really offended a lot of people but that's also the one where I started getting feedback from people that they were really getting set free. Um, the message of the cross is the liberating message that is the most offensive outwardly, the most unappealing outwardly. We don't want it as long as we're clinging to our own righteousness, but it's our place of rest. The cross is the place to rest, right? Uh, what is the message of the cross? Basically, it is that God has crucified us in Christ. It's not just that he crucified Christ for us. It's that he crucified us in Christ. He did judge us. He did put us to death. He didn't just forgive us and bring us into his kingdom uh, he forgave us and also terminated us and start something new in our spirit called the new creation and the old creation has been judged by God all the way back at the flood he judged that the flesh would not live before him he repented that he created man but he saved Noah and out of Noah had a called people who were called out of the Adamic human race to bring forth the seed, which is Christ, who through his death and resurrection came to produce a new creation in resurrection, new humanity. The old things, good and bad, are all condemned. We don't believe that initially. We come to Jesus and say, he forgave my sins and now I can serve him. And that starts the life of trying to bring the flesh into service to God and building up self-righteous works of the flesh that become a veil, even though you're saved. And it's revealed that you're veiled when you get offended at the message of the cross, which says, no, all those virtues you're trying to cultivate and use in God's service are judged by him. They are unfit, they're unworthy, they're not sanctioned, they're not allowed. It's called the flesh and it has to go to the cross. That message is extremely offensive as long as you're trying to build up your own righteousness, which we all do. Babes in Christ try to build up their own righteousness. And unfortunately, some of them get into positions of ministry before that's ever broken. And once you're in a position of ministry, you cling to it even more tightly. Okay, that's what happened with the Pharisees. You know, some of those Pharisees got saved, like Nicodemus. But he had to eventually, like Paul, count all that righteousness as dung in order to gain Christ. You either are counting your righteousness as dung to gain Christ or... You're trying to synchronize your flesh with God's standard to make a caricature that you're calling ministry. 
and that ministry is not useful uh but anyway the message where i started really seeing people get free and offended at the same time was when i started te teaching on love uh okay. you know the lord shippers were saying that we weren't walking in love because we were saying no you, this is the gospel this is the way you have to walk in this you're causing people to stumble their response was you're not walking in love towards me didn't seem like they cared about what was happening to new believers the fact that they had no assurance while they were listening to these people you know as they tried to bring them under the law but they said we didn't walk in love and we didn't walk love god and they loved god with all their heart and there and you were supposed to love each other with all our heart that was their argument so i started teaching you don't love god <laughs> and my point is and you can go look at the messages that uh in this is love not that we love god but that he loved us and gave his son for us that we may live through him and god has shed abroad his love in our heart by the holy spirit and that love exists in the fellowship of the holy spirit and it's the love of the father for the son and the love of the son for the father and we've been brought into union in that fellowship to enjoy that love it is a vicarious love it's not our love our love along with the rest of our virtues has been condemned to the cross um one of the most subtle works-based teachings in christianity that most people just buy into is uh, uh, that we must now we're Christians we've been justified and forgiven now we just love God with all of our heart soul and mind and strength and love each other love our neighbors as ourselves okay well the problem is is that is called the sum of the law <laughs> that's not a new commandment the new commandment is to believe in the name of Jesus and love one another but that love is a little different the new love comes from the eternal life and it's not what humans define as lovingness and loving it does have some warmth to it but it cares for the truth what it is is it's a love that's not like Cain and Abel Cain hated his brother because Abel insisted only on the blood as his righteousness and offered the firstling of the flock so his deeds were righteous and Abel didn't, our Cain didn't just hate Abel, he hated that kind of righteousness. That is the hatred in 1 John that he says we can't have and be saved. So when he's talking about loving, he's actually talking about how to recognize the children of God by their testimony. Someone who has the blood of Christ is born of God and is my brother. But someone who goes in the way of Cain will say, no, he's not. He doesn't have enough fruit. He's not working like I am. <laughs> so when it comes to love it's all in that context uh, but the thing is is the Cain the way of Cain is to think that you love God and you work real hard to bring forth from the cursed ground fruit to satisfy God when God's condemned the ground God told them it was cursed they had to toil as a result of the curse that wasn't what God wanted. God didn't want the fruit of the ground as an offering. He wanted the firstling of the flock. Blood is the only way that I can stand before God. Faith in the blood. And that's what Abel had. And Cain tried to bring forth fruit from the earth, representing bringing forth righteousness from the flesh, which has been cursed and condemned. Now, the most subtle not the most subtle but the most difficult I find is the kind of righteousness that says I do love God with all my heart and I've always loved him and I love everybody and I recognize people by this love and I say that you're not a brother unless you love the way I love but this love is not the love of God it's the love of the flesh which is a flattering self-glorifying love that supplies me with a feeling 
and obligates you to me. And I supply you with a feeling that obligates you to me and I to you. It is a vertical only kind of love. Uh, not vertical, horizontal, sorry. The point being that this kind of love is actually condemned by God. It's likened to leaven um, or honey. But uh, it's a sweetener, but it's not legit. It's not real. And it's exposed when it quickly turns to hatred. Okay? So I started teaching, no, you don't love God. And I said it in a dramatic way to make the point. It's not that we love him. It's that he loved us. And our love for God is just our growth in the knowledge of his love for us. It's all Christ-centered. It's not a demand on me to be nice to you. That is political love. And it usually devolves to flattery. And I just remember I was in a church where a whole bunch of sisters came up against the brothers in a really, it lasted months. And they were clearly just outright in rebellion to the truth of the word of God. And they hated it. They hated the elder. And the more rebellious they got, there were some brothers in there too, uh, the more hatred they manifested towards us, the more, quote, love they showed to each other to the point where they were literally hugging each other the entire time during meetings while they glared at us. I mean, it was really this gross affection that was not proper. I mean, it wasn't, it was weird. It wasn't love. It was them supplying each other with a feeling. And it, eventually that love breaks down and becomes a feeling of obligation and someone else feels you owe them. You know, all the things I've done for you. <laughs> so, that kind of love is just canceled out. That is not the love of God. The love of God doesn't seek its own. And the love of God believes all things and hopes all things, right? And in, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. In the, kind, the human love, and I'll tell you, the entirety of Christianity is basically built on this concept that people think they love God. And they're trying to love each other with their lovingness, which is really just this obligatory flattery stuff that's like a syrup, that what it does is it blinds you and keeps you from seeing the truth because your loyalties are to people and not to Christ and to the Word. The true love is loyal to the Word first and will correct and rebuke if needed. I'll risk my reputation to point something out, you know, uh, if it's going to set some people free, even if it costs me something. But the natural human love, which is really just hatred in disguise, dressed up to look uh, nice, but it's political, and it's for, it's for personal advantage. That love, which is condemned because it's part of the fallen human virtues, uh, that love creates these obligatory relationships that fill up Christianity until the point where no one can speak the truth anymore. And I've called that the lukewarm drink of Laodicea. That's why Laodicea is not hot or cold. But lukewarm, it's this mixture where there's ambiguity because everybody's trying to love each other and the truth can't prevail anymore. Because if you speak the truth, you're not walking in love. How dare you correct this person? Don't you know, that's my friend, you know. That's what's going on right now on YouTube. It's people are lining up on walls and saying, hey, I got your back. I'm your friend. We've been through thick and thin. And yeah, you owe me. And if someone says, no, that's not true, uh, what you just said, that has to, no, this isn't right. That person says, after all the things I've done for you, I taught you everything you know. And for you to go to that other camp, you know, that stuff's going on. Uh, that is not love. And the people who say, oh, I love God, and the people who say, David Benjamin, or any of these teachers, don't love God and, and love Ben, and that's how we know them by their fruit. They're talking about something that's not the love of God. They're talking about the flesh, but they don't realize it. 
And so when I was addressing this in those love teachings, people got really offended. Not just the people who were lordshipping at the time, but people in the grace community. It created a big stink. And that is the root. That message is the root of the so-called camps, I believe, that came out. It looks like it's about dreams, and it looks like it's about this or that, but it's not. The root of it is that our righteousness is condemned. Okay, our virtue is condemned to the cross. We're not here to cultivate our virtue. We're here to rest in the finished work of Christ and acknowledge my love is dead, my flesh is dead, there's no demand on it. It is no longer to be I, but Christ who lives in me. And people get offended at that message, plain and simple. You know, Paul is the one who brought that message to the church, and the entire church rejected it. Uh, that's what happened eventually to the churches in Asia, is they departed from Paul's ministry. He had already said in Timothy, you know, all the churches in Asia departed from me. And that doesn't mean they weren't churches or that they weren't saved, but they had a thick veil. And that's why Ephesus is said to have lost her first love. When you get to Revelation, you see those seven churches, those are all in Asia. That means all those churches pretty much had departed from Paul's ministry. And Ephesus was the first that struggled. He sent Timothy there, and John eventually came there to try to bring them back to Christ as the focus, you know. And that's what we're in in the book of John. But um, this is kind of a wandering message, but that's the root of the offense. And you can go back and look at those teachings uh, and just see if you agree. I mean, do you agree? Not everybody's going to agree, especially someone who really thinks they love God and love God even before they were saved. That offends them to no end. And I didn't know that at the time, really. I mean, I knew some of the grace people were offended, but I had my eyes on the Lord shippers that were backloading works and then accusing us of not loving God and, and saying that we don't keep the commandments and all this stuff. And I realized they don't know what the new commandment is. Love God with all your heart has been replaced with believe Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's our substitute, even in love for God. The love we have for God is called the spirit of sonship that's been shed abroad in our heart. Because we're sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Our love is vicarious. It's not our love. It's Christ's love. And that's why Ephesians says, Blessed are those who love him in incorruptibility. It's gold, silver, and precious stones. Incorruptible material, not wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, you can either build, you can be a saved person, but our work that damages the body is called wood, hay, and stubble because it's from the flesh and it can't stand the test of fire. When the fire comes, it's revealed as not being real and being burned up. On the one hand, that's talking about the fire at the judgment, right before the judgment seat. Uh, but on the other hand, the fire of tribulation and persecution and offense will test what you're operating in and what it's made of. Can it endure? The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit is the one thing that has endured my entire Christian life. Not that I love him, but that he loved me and gave his son for me. That's the one unshakable foundation, no matter what kind of condition I'm in, what kind of trouble I'm in. He's always been able to bring me back to the fact that he gave Christ for me and he's my life and my past is buried and my righteousness is no longer required. I'm free to just believe in Jesus Christ. And that causes his spirit to bear witness in me that uh, God's record is true concerning his son and that I'm a child of God and an heir together with Christ. And the more he brings me to focus on that, the more my heart is at rest, which strengthens me to be able to go through these things where everybody gets offended and yet not fold my ministry or get swallowed up. How do you think I'd do that when all these people, hundreds of people, are chattering all over the different walls about me? And that's been since the Lordship thing. That's nothing new. That's been my whole Christian life. 
how did I survive that and still keep wanting to serve the Lord and not be bitter and just shut down? Well, it's not my love, i tell you that. If it were on me, I would have gotten offended at everybody and cussed them all out, left and packed up my channel and taken my ball home. Uh, no. What, what he does is he keeps, I, sometimes I do get condensed, like, oh, did I create all this offense, Lord? You know, um, and w the only answer is to know how to stand in justification. His blood covers me and my, my past is, I'm dead. If anything good is being produced in me, it's because of Christ. And only that day is going to reveal it. In that day, all of us are going to have wood, hay, and stubble burned off. And we're also going to have some gold, silver, and precious stones that pass through the fire and are found to praise, honor, and glory at the coming of Jesus Christ and his revelation. We're all going to have that. It's not going to hurt. There's going to be no reference to that old stuff. It's going to burn up. And everybody has some wood, hay, and stubble, and everybody has some gold, silver, and precious stones. The answer is not to get offended and freaked out every time you look back and go, uh-oh, there's some good wood, hay, and stubble. Paul got to the point where he didn't judge himself anymore. That doesn't mean he wasn't in fear and trembling. He said, I buffet my body, try to keep it subdued, don't walk according to the flesh. Only the Lord can teach you that. Uh, and he does it through trying you again and again and again and burning off a lot of the stuff you used to defend, your righteousness. As long as you're defending your righteousness and offended when your righteousness is exposed as being condemned and offended at the message of the cross and s insisting that you love God with the entirety of your heart and then insisting that you measure everybody else by your perception of what love is, which is this weird flattery thing that supplies everybody with a feeling that's not the love of God focused on the person and work of Christ. Uh, as long as you are you know, insisting on that kind of righteousness, you're going to get swallowed up every time someone comes and corrects or, you know, anything. Uh, so, that to me is really the, hey, uh, the uh, root of the issue um, that I see was the start of people uh, getting offended, you know. It looks like it's about other things, but it's really not. And it, that's been consistent in my ministry, that I focus on the crucified Christ as the way. And I'm not saying something great about me. I'm only saying that because that's the only truth that ever set me free of anything. And I'm sharing the comfort with which I've been comforted by God. But it offends people who are still clinging to various forms of legalistic righteousness. They think is their service to God. And they feel threatened when you say no, you know, now I never told anybody, you don't love God. It was a teaching. It wasn't directed at a person. It was a polemic. It was a, it was part of the argument about what is law righteousness versus Christ as our righteousness. Okay. Don't think that, I mean, you can go back and look at the videos. There's not an ounce of, uh, attack in any of these things. Um, but people got really offended. <laughs> And so my prayer through all this has been, you know, as long as people who are clinging to their own righteousness are tucked into the grace community and new believers can't discern the difference between legalistic self-made righteousness and the righteousness of God, which is Christ, it just makes it really hard. And then if you try to adjust, everybody says, how dare you? You're not walking in love. I mean, it's been, it's like a broken record, you know, and I'm called a false prophet and all these different things. Well, why don't you go listen to my teachings and see if they line up with the word of God. And if so, do they offend you? And if they offend you, why? You'll find ultimately that it's not me that's offensive. I mean, I have an obnoxious personality. God has chosen the foolish things. He has deliberately chosen obnoxious things, the base things, the abominable things, the things the world despises. Uh, he does that as part of his tactic to offend people in the hope that they'll see, wow, I thought I was really full of love and righteousness, but it turns out I am so offended and I can't get over it. And I'm attacking everybody now. You know, that is the best thing that can happen, even though it's ugly 
because then the truth is revealed. See, the Pharisees ruled over everyone because everybody thought they were righteous. But when Jesus came, their hatred for him manifested what they really were so that the people caught an ambiguity in the middle could finally discern and go, oh, that, I don't want to follow that, you know. Uh, and it liberated people and set them free. Because as long as that legalistic Pharisee righteousness is upheld, the new ones are under condemnation because they can't do it as well, you know. Then they find out, wow, it's not even required of me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, praise God, I'm free. So like I said, this kind of ministry, on the one hand, sets people free. On the other hand, offends people. And that's probably going to keep happening until the end. And there were several series of teachings that I did that were offensive. But my intention wasn't to offend people. It was to set people free from various forms of mystical legalism and law-based legalism. That's all it is. My thing is about Christ as our righteousness, Christ as our sanctification, Christ as our hope of glory. And that's what I teach. Um, well, this is a long walk. I didn't quite say what I wanted to say. I'm trying to say it, but uh, hopefully this blessed some of you guys. And who knows? Offended you, maybe. All right, take care.